We have visitors in our midst and we want you to know with all of our heart, we're grateful that you're here. We hope we have an opportunity to uh, meet you after our services. We do have Bible classes about 10, 15 minutes after we close our worship service. We invite you to be a part of those classes as well. For any of you that live in Southeast Texas for any amount of time at all, of course, I was born in Port Arthur, uh, you would know Artie Brown, gospel preacher for over 60 years, passed away yesterday uh, in his sleep. He was my uncle. He had a great and profound effect upon Christianity in Texas. And I'm proud to call him my uncle and thankful for his life dedicated to truth. He baptized me into Christ when I was 12. And I learned much of what I know from him. And so we'll miss him. But we know that there's prepared, prepared a place for him, as there is for us, for all of those who love the Lord our God and seek to obey. I've been asked to preach in a summer series at the Granbury Church in Granbury, Texas. And they, uh, they've got a lot of what I call uh, big dog preachers that are coming to that thing, so... I'm, uh, I'm really studying an awful lot, um, and they gave everybody um, an assignment. Uh, we're looking at uh, various men in Scripture, who they were before they came to the Lord, and who they were, are, um, after they obeyed God and dedicated their life to Him. I have been given Saul, and so you're going to be a recipient of my study. I'm, I'm reading uh, several books right now and am fascinated uh, by what uh, I have learned um, in this uh, amount of time uh, that I have had to prepare. There's a lot of talk in the world about transformation. I hear it all the time, improving yourself, um, rising higher, um, a, a new wardrobe, uh, maybe that's going to change the way I see things or the way others see me. Uh, new cosmetics to maybe help the wrinkles. Uh, surgeries of some kind, and believe me, ladies and gentlemen, there's all kinds of surgeries that you're supposed to be able to get to keep you from looking old. Diets, relocation, new friends, cultivating a better self-image, just the attitude that you have in this life about the fact that something has to change. Well, what I have learned is, is that real transformation cannot come from inside, and it can't really come from outside, at least from all that this world has to offer. But Christianity is all about complete transformation. In mind and in body and soul. Now, this verse teaches this so perfectly in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. But I want to concentrate right quick on the amazing verse 11. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Christianity is transformation. But people can't change themselves. Jeremiah chapter 13 teaches me, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? For though thou wash thee with lye, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord Jehovah. We can't correct ourselves from the inside, by ourselves. Even extensive pressure on the outside can't bring about true change. We can't wash ourselves without Christ Jesus and his blood. We can't spiritually wash ourselves. 
We can't alter who we are without Christ. Who we really are spiritually. We can't get help from others that accomplish this feat without Jesus Christ. We don't even have the ability on our own to respond to divine force, to to divine discipline, to divine punishment. I thought this was an interesting passage in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 22. Crush a fool in a mortar with a pestle along with the crushed grain, yet his folly will not depart from him. Fascinating passage. Jeremiah had to say this, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Isaiah chapter 1 verse 5 through 6, man is sick from the top of his head to the sole of his feet and everywhere in between. But people still long for transformation. I long for for transformation. I long to be different, to be better all around, to be rescued from wretchedness, to be rescued from putridity that this world has to offer and that has seeped in to who I am. And the external circumstances that I face. Without Jesus, I cannot be successful. There is only one. There is only one who can totally transform a person on the inside and the outside. And that is Jesus Christ. And the way that that is accomplished is through the gospel of Jesus Christ that we preach today in this church. And every day of our lives. I want us to look at one such remarkable transformation. Open your Bibles to the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. I am so grateful for Albert having read that proficiently. I thank him because I don't have to do it and we have a limited amount of time. Here is a man who claimed to be the world's worst sinner. He said it himself, who lived for one purpose, to uphold a false and damning religion. He deemed it his responsibility to hurt and to injure and to imprison Jesus' followers. Christians. He determined that it was his inspired right, ladies and gentlemen, to kill people whom he saw as a threat to that religion. Here is a man who blasphemed the God that he thought he served in the worst kind of way. Here is a man who made people who loved God Almighty suffer torture. Here is a man who was a hireling of crooked politicians. Go back and read about him. This description of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, is brutal and it is bloody. He would remind you of a terrorist rather than a committed disciple of Judaism. He held the clothes of the first martyr of Christianity, Stephen. He was an accomplice that agreed with this heinous crime. He might as well have thrown the large stones on top of the head of our brother, Stephen. He was guilty of murder in the first degree. He was guilty of murder with malice. The truth is he hated the name of Jesus. He hated it. He hated the way. He hated to hear the phrase, the way. He had determined in his heart to persecute and kill Christians in allegiance, listen to it, in allegiance to Jehovah, our God. Oh, yeah. Our God. The God of heaven and the God of earth. Now, has that sunk in? Are you getting that picture? We must never forget where this man came from, this Saul 
of Tarsus. If we understand the darkness of his past, which he quickly would tell you about in shame and disgust, if we understand the darkness of his past, we will understand the gratitude for grace. That's the Saul we need to clearly see. If we are to appreciate the truth that he wrote about in his epistles, we must see him, ladies and gentlemen, for who he was. But he was transformed. Totally, radically transformed. I hope you have your New Testaments open to Acts chapter 9. I hope you're there. A miracle appearance of Jesus on the road to Damascus in a blinding, miraculous, heavenly light. This this was a supernatural event. This is a conversion. And in some ways, it's a conversion like no other conversion in Scripture. We don't have another one like this, I don't believe. Something miraculous. And first person from Jesus Christ had to happen in order for this man to become an apostle, to be added to the 12. This man from that day forward was completely changed. He was metamorphosized. He went from a dirt worm to a butterfly. Are you getting the picture? Unbelievable. This murderous, Christ-hating killer is totally transformed. This chapter in Acts gives us a picture of that transformation that I hope each and every one of us go back and look at from time to time in our life because from it, we will see parallels to our own conversion. Your conversion... Your salvation was initiated by God from heaven in Jesus Christ. You're no different. And through his death and resurrection and your obedience to the gospel, you were changed and transformed. In a transformed life, there is a clear introduction to Christ. I want to simply remind you that Saul of Tarsus knew and understood the gospel of Christ. He knew the gospel because no one can be saved without the gospel. It's impossible to be saved without the gospel. Romans chapter 10 verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Faith comes by hearing the truth about Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. You have to hear the word and believe it. It has to convict you. So long before the Damascus Road experience, let me assure you that Paul heard the gospel of Christ. And that just hit me, ladies and gentlemen, like a rock in the noggin. He had heard it. In those days, the very movement of Christianity that they called the way because of its exclusivity you see he hated that he hated that Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life and he hated that please understand the exclusivity of Christianity it is the only way there is no other way Jesus said I am the way please understand this there is salvation in no other Only the way, the truth, and the life. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It was the narrowness of Christianity that Paul completely understood. He clearly knew why it was called the way. And there was no other way. 
That's what they were saying. There was no other way, and that included Judaism. He heard it all. His response to it was to lead in the stoning of Stephen, to murder people. He knew the gospel of Christ, ladies and gentlemen. He knew it. He knew what the claims of the way were. And he rejected them as blasphemous. He knew the truth about Christ. He rejected it. He rejected it until the Damascus road. Until that point. Saul, who had been persecuting the Lord Jesus Christ, fell on his face and he said, Yes, Lord. You are Lord. He made a confession that Christ was everything that he had heard these Christians say about him. It was at that moment that he heard Jesus And he began the belief process. Here on the Damascus Road, he believed. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In Christ, there is transformation. Paul was radically transformed. He was thoroughly transformed. Transform. And the New Testament spells it out something like this. The one who is dead in sins becomes alive to righteousness. That's what happens. The one who is ignorant of truth becomes wise in divine truth. The one who is insensitive to divine presence now tastes and sees that the Lord is good. It didn't taste good before, but it tastes real good now, and we eat the Scripture up. The one who is blind can now see. The one who is in darkness is in the blazing light. The one who belonged to the kingdom of Satan belongs to the kingdom of God's dear son. But that's not all. The one who did evil continually now finds the cry of his heart is to do that which is good. We don't always do what's good, but the cry of our heart is to do good. Our desire is to do good. What drives us in our life is to do good, ladies and gentlemen. That is what Christianity is about. The one who didn't even know what the question was or what the questions were. Now has all the answers. How does he have all the answers? Because of the perfection of the word of God. The one who is bound for hell is bound for heaven. Hallelujah. The one who hated God now loves God. The one who loves sin now hates sin. The rebel is a son. The enemy is a friend. That's the transformation. That's what happens when Christ comes into a life. It is a death of the old life and a resurrection to a new life. And that is realized in baptism. Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6. That's point number one. Point number two is this. Someone who is transformed enters into a dependence and communion with God. What do I mean by that? This is really an amazing thing, I think. Who is this Ananias? Who is this guy? All of a sudden, boom, there's Ananias in the text. What's he all about? Well, he's a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Possibly the leader of the Christians there. We don't know, but uh, scholars, different ones I've read, seems to assume so. He might be a target of Saul's persecution campaign. Um, I'm sure he probably thought that he had a bullseye on his back. Interestingly... At least for me, he's a Jew. 
Okay, now that may not mean much to you, but over in chapter 22 where Paul gives his testimony, listen to what he says about Ananias. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by the Jews who lived there. Ananias is a Jew. That didn't really register with me either. Ananias is a loyal, faithful Jew who lives by the standard of the law. He really lives by the standard of the law. He is well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. He is highly respected. He's a, he's a significant, I guess you could say, Jewish man. And what was it that the Lord told him to do? He said, go to the street called straight which is a street yeah, it's not a fictitious thing I always wondered whether or not it was straight or not Damascus was a real place street was a real street I mean straight was a real street and when you go there what is it that you find Paul doing if you're Ananias and you make it over there to the to the street that's straight, or the street that's called straight, what do you find Saul of Tarsus doing? What is he doing? Scripture says he was praying. Now, I just want to park on that for a minute. Can we just park right there, put the emergency brake on just for a second? How in the world did that happen? Let me tell you something. That is the first response of obedience and conversion that is the first response I believe there is a crying out for communion with God for closeness with God there is a, a, a desire to know and to understand better now remember that 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 Saul had always prayed the prayers of Pharisees he prayed the legalistic prayers of one who thought that he was righteous. You see, they thought they were righteous. Righteous in their own way. Not the way, it's their own way that they felt like they were righteous. And it was on their own merit. Egotistical and arrogant outfits. Now he prays in blind helpless dependency he's trying to sort out what it just what happened just now the fire breather has lost his fury three days of prayer three days now I just want to be honest with you guys I find it difficult to pray for 15 minutes three days he prayed. You don't think this was a significant event? If you'd seen the Lord Jesus Christ, I bet you and me, we'd be praying for three days. We'd figure out what that was, wouldn't we? If we could get our face off the ground. The transformed life is the life that cries out to God. For the Christian prayer is the breath of that new life. And I need to learn how to do it better. And if I have convinced my brother Daniel of anything in the last several months, I hope I've convinced him to do a series on prayer. I challenge him. Because we need it. Well, I found this quote, and I think it's good. Prayer is simply the soul of a Christian moving under the pressure of the presence of God. Now, just let that soak in for a minute. It fascinates me because I believe it's true. Prayer is the most natural thing, the, the most inevitable thing, the most immediate thing. You don't need a manual, ladies and gentlemen. 
He cries out to his new Lord. Everything in his life has changed. Everything else that he once knew is now, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, what? Manure. That's what he says. Everything else that he knew in the past is dung. Everything he once hoped in, everything he once worked for, everything he expected, all religious uh, attainments, if you will, all spiritual acc accolades, he says is manure. Worthless. He's crying out for everything he needs because everything has gone. Everything he's known has been stripped from him. He is naked. For three days, he's crying out to his new Lord. He has no other person to turn to. There is no other way. So here's Saul. He doesn't know what hit him. His whole life is turned completely upside down. <laughs> He's now a believer in the one he persecuted. He has now confessed him as Lord and Savior. He is now acting in obedience to him. He is now calling him the Messiah that he was laughing about and ridiculing the people who believed in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, not more than a week before. He is helpless and he is blind and he is waiting for whatever it is that God has next for him. And I'll tell you what God has next for him. Anna and I said, chapter 22 of Acts, verse 16 in the recollection of the apostle Paul he said to him arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord now the book that I'm reading right now about Saul of Tarsus that gentleman doesn't mention a thing about that not one thing and I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself wait a minute just going over there to 22 and go ahead and get the whole story here man you just get you only got one part of the story get over to 22 catch the other part of that story he never talks about it but I'm going to talk about it because the only way that you can come in contact with the blood of Christ is through baptism scripture is clear about that and Saul of Tarsus did that very thing he confessed the Lord Jesus Christ. He repented of his past and he was baptized for the remission of sin. Look at verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to, appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Evidence of transformation is a desire to serve others, and it becomes a priority in life. And I'm combining that with my fourth point here that you'll see in just a minute that coincide with verse 17 through 19. Christianity is about service. Christianity is about service because Jesus Christ is about service. Now, I'm not going to take the time because we don't have the time to go through all the passages of service that the Lord has provided for the people that you can see in Scripture. But I'm telling you, it's about service. And we are empowered for that service by the Holy Spirit. We are gifted by that Holy Spirit for that service. And so that leads to the very next element in the conversion of Paul, which is also, I believe, very parallel to us. Now remember, let's go back and remember, a transformed life starts with faith in the Word of God, communion with the living God, and service in the kingdom. And a transformed life is led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is bestowed on the Apostle Paul and it fills him. He can't do what he's called to do without the Holy Spirit. You shall be filled with the Holy Spirit in order that you might do the ministry you're called to do. 
It's not done in human strength. Human strength can't accomplish the ministry. You remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, our Lord said, You will be witnesses unto me, but not until the Holy Spirit comes to you. And the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, and the gospel was unleashed on the world, and the power of the Holy Spirit was unleashed. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, be filled, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It means to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Well, how in the world is it that you get under control of the Holy Spirit? Okay, I've been hearing that my whole life. Well, how do you get there? How does that happen? It means to be what? It means to be under the control. To be filled means to be under the control. It means to be under uh, the control by submitting to his will. It means being under control by the Holy Spirit because we have been completely obedient to the word. It's not something, ladies and gentlemen, that's mystical in some way or, or um, esoteric, if you will, or, or ecstatic, or something like that. It is simply submitting to his will. It's simply submitting to the word of God. Ephesians verse 5, verse 18, Scripture says, be filled with the Spirit. Okay, now I believe that the apostle is talking to each and every one of us, and it's interesting to me that in Colossians, the apostle Paul says in verse 16 of chapter 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Chapter 5, verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. When you obey the Word of God, you are being led by the Holy Spirit. His power is connected to the Word of God. It's connected to obedience. The Spirit lives in every believer. Listen to me. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have obeyed Him and you are trying to follow His commands and you are trying the best in the world that you can try to live the life that you've been taught to live and to bring others to Christ as well, the Holy Spirit is a part of The Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, and, the, and, and the, the, the gospel was unleashed on the world in his power. It's an important thing. It's something we need to give thought to. We are all the temple house of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit takes control because we obey the word of God, then all things that are promised to us take place. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, but we manifest the fruit of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, we begin to understand the deep things of God under the Spirit's illuminating power. That means that the Spirit turns on the bright light so we can see and we can understand. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 through 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. We are guided by the Spirit, confident in our position in Him and His power in our lives. Now, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Spirit-filled husbands treat their wives in a godly fashion. Spirit-filled wives treat their husband based on God's Word. Okay? I don't care what it is that the latest magazine says about the way it is that you're supposed to treat your husband. You need to go back to the book and you need to find out what it says about that because there's a whole lot of wives that think they don't have to follow this. And there's a whole lot of husbands that don't think they need to either. Spirit-filled parents care for their children properly. That's just a part of being Christ-like. Spirit-filled children obey their parents. 
for this is right. Spirit-filled managers take care of their employees. Plain and simple. Spirit-filled servants honor their masters. It dominates your life, Christianity does. It's living life according to the Word of God. What is it that Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15? He says, I die daily. I die daily. I put off the old and I put on Christ. I set my will aside and I put his will on. My ambition is to please him, living in communion with God Almighty, being committed to serve in whatever way he calls us to serve. And listen to me, if you will just open your eyes as a Christian, you will see the opportunities that will come before you. It's called the Holy Spirit through providence. As he dwells and lives in you and works in you through the word of God that you have made a part of your heart. That is the change that occurs in a transformed life. That is the change that took place in Saul and will take place in us when we repent, confess his name, and put on Christ in baptism. I cannot believe that I got that done in that amount of time. I didn't think that was possible. It has been such an honor this morning to think together and ponder scripture with you as it regards Saul's conversion. And I'm telling you, what I'm doing right now is I'm taking that book and some commentaries and I'm learning from that and I'm using that uh, to continue to build this, uh, this lesson that they want me to, uh, to preach. I love to look at the components and elements illustrated for every soul's transformation. This is the only way that sinners can be transformed, passing from spiritual death to eternal life. We must thank the Lord for his sovereign work of salvation. You want to have something to pray for, you pray about that. We must thank the Lord. He has reached down and saved sinners. We must rejoice in that. And I know there may be still some today, maybe even some that are right here in this meeting house, that, that are alienated from the Lord without any hope of change or, or hope of a new life, without any hope of a new heart or a new way of thinking. Transformation. Longing for a new life and a relationship with the Lord. But sadly, still engulfed, buried, bound, helplessly, hopelessly in sin and death. You cannot do it by yourself. It is only through Christ. Only through the Lord. Let me leave you with one passage and then we'll have our invitation song. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Therefore I urge you brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Are you subject to the invitation of the Lord this morning? Do you need to change your life? Do you want to transform do you want to become one of God's children? You can by simply obeying the word of God. Simple. Simply obeying and then determining to live that life for the rest of your life. Maybe someone here needs to, to get their life right with God. And maybe you do, are desirous of that this morning. It's not necessary. I don't guess that you come forward, but you need to tell us. Let's get together, put our arms around you. You tell us, we'll help you. God Almighty is ready to forgive you. He's ready to set you back on the straight and narrow path. If you're subject to that invitation, won't you come as we stand and sing?